I want to welcome you here to the St. Francis Room on this uh, beautiful, cool fall, crisp fall day. Come on in. Yes. We were hoping you'd open up the doors, see if there were doors, if there are chairs in there. So we should have some more chairs. I know there are some students coming after 3.20 when, they're, when their uh, class is let out. I'm going to try this one. Yep. So welcome to the St. Francis Room and a talk this afternoon by Elizabeth Fuller Valentine um, Esquire on asserting the fund a fundamental constitutional right to a stable climate. I want to tell you a little bit about um, Beth Valentine, and I should say um, I first met her I at the University of Maine Law School, and she was leading a meeting of people who were doing really good and important work, and some of that is what she's going to be talking about today. Um, she, uh, she got her undergraduate degree in English and Biology from Hamilton College and a master's in Marine Affairs from the University of Rhode Island. So this is a woman who knows her environment as well as her law. She worked for 15 years in environmental management and sustainable development. In her first career, she developed training programs for coastal managers in Sri Lanka. She, she established a program to certify environmentally responsible marinas in Maryland, and she prepared a management plan for the Wakwaut Bay, Wakwaut Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve on Cape Cod. So right there, that's a pretty good um, <laughs> career to begin with. Um, and then uh, after a period as stay-at-home mom, she went to law school, graduating from the University of Maine School of Law in 2014 with honors. While she was a student, she worked for an organization called Our Children's Trust uh, on climate change litigation. And I believe that's probably the seed which, which grew into this, is that true? Grew into this talk. Um, and she also worked in the Refugee and Human Rights Clinic. She's presently an attorney in Portland with the form of firm of Jackson and McNichol, uh, where she represents Social Security claimants in administrative hearings and in federal court. She also volunteers significant time to efforts to address climate change, which brings us to the room where I met her. Um, a group of people, if it, any of you in, uh, in the past year or so have found yourselves tired of speed dialing your representatives and senators on your phone, I was so inspired to meet people in Portland led um, by Beth Val Valentine and some of her colleagues at the Maine School of Law. I was so inspired to see people who were finding other ways to make a difference and I'm very, very excited and pleased to be able to welcome here, her here to the UNE today. Please welcome Beth Valentine. Well, thank you. I'm really happy to be here this afternoon. Um, and I want to thank Professor Woodworth for inviting me to come speak with you. This afternoon, can people hear me? This seems like an awkward place for the microphone. <laughs> um, I'm going to be drawing on my paper titled um, Arguments in Support of a Constitutional Right to Atmospheric Integrity. As the name suggests, it presents theoretical arguments for Supreme Court recognition of a federal constitutional right to a stable climate. I will then discuss the claims in an actual ongoing lawsuit in which youth petitioners are suing the federal government for failing to protect their constitutional rights to a stable climate. I'll conclude by shifting away from constitutional arguments and discuss um, an effort here in Maine to compel the Department of Environmental Protection to implement a law that was passed in 2003 calling on the state to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, quote, sufficient to eliminate any dangerous threat to the climate. I'm not going to delve into the science of climate change except to note the amount of carbon dioxide in the air increased at an extreme rate last year, according to the World Meteorological Organization's Greenhouse Gas Bulletin dated October 30th, 2017. Globally average concentrations of carbon dioxide reached 403.3 parts per million in, 200, in 2016, which was up from 400.00 parts per million the year before. The rate of increase of atmospheric carbon dioxide over the past 70 years is nearly 100 times larger than at the end of the last ice age. The bulletin reports that as far as direct and proxy observations can tell, such abrupt changes in the atmospheric levels of CO2 have never been have never been before been seen. While the situation is dire, there is still hope. Dr. James Hansen and other leading climate scientists have calculated that a return to approximately 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere 
would restore the Earth's energy balance and limit warming to about one degree Celsius. This goal can be achieved this century by reducing greenhouse gas emissions 8% per year while also simultaneously affecting um, carbon storage in the biosphere and soils, for example, through reforestation and improved agricultural practices. If we delay emission reductions until 2020, a reduction of 15% per year will be required to achieve 350 parts per million by 2100. Delay not only increases the magnitude of the necessary annual emission reductions, it also further imperils youth and future generations. Because the physical climate system has great inertia, there's already additional climate change in the pipeline, so to speak. Temperatures will continue to increase due to carbon that has already been emitted. Ongoing emissions will increase the total amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and further increase Earth's energy imbalance and associated repercussions. As a consequence, youth and future generations are likely to face grave consequences resulting from past and current emissions, even though they bear no responsibility for the decisions have, that have brought us to this situation. Within the United States, political and private sector responses to climate change could be guided by judicial recognition of a fundamental right to atmospheric integrity. Recognition of such a right would aid in protecting current and future Americans from the worst effects of climate change. A right to atmospheric integrity would also establish America's obligation to reduce greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere to a level that will permit the global climate to remain within the range in which modern civilization has developed. That is, an obligation for the nation to do its part to return the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide to 350 parts per million. Um, I'll begin by defining terms. Um, as you know, there are many different types of rights. Um, scholar Richard, Richard Hiskies describes rights as those principles that protect people from threats to their physical well-being, political equality, or sense of dignity. Today I will be talking about basic or natural rights, human rights, and constitutional rights. Basic rights are those, let me see it this way. Basic rights are those rights that are essential to normal life and which are the prerequisite to the practice of all other rights. For example, air to breathe, water to drink, and food to eat are basic necessities of life. The concept of basic rights is conceptually similar to the 17th and 18th century con concept of moral or natural rights. According to John Locke, Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson, and others, natural rights, unlike legal or contractual rights, are universal and exist independently of government. You can see the concept of natural rights reflected in the Declaration of Independence, for example. Certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Human rights, like natural rights, exist independently of, of states. People have human rights because they are people, not because they live in a particular place. Human rights, though, differ from natural rights in that human rights presume the existence of government and define relationships between governments and citizens. As such, human rights are fundamental international moral and legal norms which protect people from severe but common social, political, and legal abuses. Constitutional rights are those textual and non-textual rights protected by a state or national constitution. Textual rights are easiest to understand. Wrong way, sorry. Um, taking the First Amendment as an example. The First Amendment guarantees freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, the right of free assembly. Um, but how do we go from this rather archaic language to understanding, um, for example, that in the absence of actual malice on the part of the publisher, the press is free to report about the actions of public figures? This articulation of freedom of the press was expressed in a very important ruling by the Supreme Court in 1964 that, among other things, permitted the free reporting of, um, the free reporting of civil rights movement. So to get to the Supreme Court, you start by filing a lawsuit. And federal lawsuits are filed in the lowest level of federal courts, U.S. District Court. In Maine, 
Um, we are in the District of Maine. There are two federal courthouses, one in Portland, one in Bangor. Um, any appeal from district court is brought to an appellate court. In this district, we would appeal to the First Circuit Court of Appeals in Boston. And from the circuit courts, um, appeals may be brought to the U.S. Supreme Court. And at each level, judges may be asked to interpret constitutional language, and they traditionally, traditionally do so using six modes of analysis um, described as textual, historical, doctrinal, prudential, structural, and ethical. And I'll define each of those in a little bit. These six modes of analysis are regularly applied to the interpretation of the words life, liberty, or property in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments of the U.S. Constitution. When the purpose of the analysis to is to identify non-textual fundamental rights, the analysis is referred to as substantive due process analysis. So the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments provide that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The rights are guaranteed by the Fifth Amendment and applied to the states through the Fourteenth Amendment. Over time, the Supreme Court has ruled that liberty interests include the right to marry, to have children, to direct the education and upbringing of one's children, to marital privacy, to the use of contraception, to bodily integrity, to abortion, and, and other liberty rights. In my paper, I argue that a new liberty interest, that is a federal right to atmospheric integrity, may be found through historical, doctrinal, prudential, structural, and ethical analysis of the Constitution. I will begin, though, with a few words with the, about the lack of textual support for a right to atmospheric integrity in the U.S. Constitution. Clearly, there is no explicit mention of, of the atmosphere of climate change in the U.S. Constitution. This absence is likely due to the Founding Fathers' inability to imagine a world transformed by human activity. One commentator described the drafters of the Bill of, of Rights as ecologically ignorant. Certainly, the state of scientific knowledge in, 19, in 1791 was less advanced than it is today. However, there is evidence that James Madison, the author of the Bill of Rights, at least considered human impacts on the environment. He insisted that destruction of entire species was forbidden by the laws of nature. Whatever the drafter's actual knowledge, given that the purpose of the Constitution is to provide for society's orderly progression through time for ourselves and our posterity, it can be presumed that the founders believed that the physical world would and should remain in a state hospitable to human life. I'll next look at historical arguments. Historical arguments are based on a construction of the original understanding of a particular constitutional provision. When there is an absence of an explicit provision, one can look to the historical understanding of a concept. I concede that it would be futile to assert that our nation has a history and legal tradition of atmospheric protection beyond those protections afforded by legislation such as the Clean Air Act. If one considers that atmospheric integrity is essential for human subsistence, however, the question becomes whether our nation has a history of recognizing intergenerational responsibility. I assert that conceptions of international responsibility can be traced back to ancient Greece and take the form of both an obligation to refrain, refrain from unduly burdening future generations and to pass along to posterity a better, more stable society. During Aristotle's time, every Athenian who wished to become a citizen was required to take an oath which stated, in relevant part, my native land I will not leave a diminished heritage, but a greater and better than I received it. The concept of intergenerational responsibility was also expressed in Roman law nearly 1,500 years ago. The text of the Institutes of Justinian declared, by the laws of nature, these things are common to mankind, the air, running water, the sea, and consequently the shores of the sea. This ancient pronouncement provides the foundation of the public trust doctrine, which holds that the sovereign, the state, holds shared resources such as the air, and trust for the public. Trustees have a fundamental common law duty to preserve and ma maintain trust assets for both present and future beneficiaries of the trust. Expressions of intergenerational obligations may also be found in American political discourse from the very earliest days of the Union up until the present. For example, 
John Adams wrote that he studied the useful science of government so that his grandchildren could pursue more cultural disciplines, such as painting and pottery, and um, poetry, rather. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison also documented their thoughts on intergenerational obligations. Using land as an analogy for debt and civil law, Jefferson wrote to Madison, the earth belongs in usufruct to the living. So I had to look up usufruct. Um, according to Merriam-Webster, it refers to the legal right of using and enjoying the fruits or profits of something belonging to another. In this letter, Jefferson is asserting that the current generation may not burden future generations with a debt or with a perpetual constitution. In response, Madison generally accepted Jefferson's objective to make constitutions sensitive to the majority will of each successive generation. However, Madison observed that obligation, obligations may indeed pass from one generation to the next, but stipulated that future generations should not be unduly burdened by contemporary decisions. He wrote, quote, it would give me singular pleasure to see it first announced to the world in a law of the state, a law of the United States, that always kept in view a salutary restraint on living generations from unjust and unnecessary burdens on their successors. Thomas Paine similarly wrote in The Rights of Man in 1792 that the Parliament, or the people of 1688, had no more right to dispose of the people of the present day or to bind or control them in any shape whatsoever than the Parliament or the people of the present have to dispense or bind or control those who are to live a hundred or a thousand years hence. Jefferson, Madison, and Paine were all writing in a political context. It is not too far of a stretch to assert, though, that their command that one generation not unduly burden another is applicable to the nation's response to climate change. Failure to act now to reduce atmospheric levels of greenhouse gases to levels compatible with climate stability will indeed bind or control those who are to live a hundred or a thousand years hence. Nearly 50 years after Paine wrote The Rights of Man, Abraham Lincoln spoke to a group of students about positive responsibilities towards future generations. Specifically, he noted the duty to transmit goodly land and a political edifice of liberty and equal rights, the former unprofaned by the foot of an invader, the later undecayed by the lapse of time and untorn by usurpation, to the latest generation that fate shall permit the world to know. This task, gratitude to our fathers, justice to ourselves, duty to posterity, and love for our species in general, all imperatively require us faithfully to perform. More recently, President Barack Obama likewise invoked our society's responsibility to future generations in his 2014 State of the Union Address. He said, when our children's children look us in the eye, ask if, we, ask if we have done all we could to leave a safer, more stable world with new sources of energy, I want us to be able to say, yes, we did. History and current discourse thus demonstrate both an obligation to refrain from unduly burdening future generations and to pass along a, to pass along a stronger, more stable society to posterity. Doctrinal arguments for constitutional rights are derived from precedent, that is, earlier rulings, or from commentary on precedent. Admittedly, U.S. President supporting precedent, supporting a constitutional environmental right is poor. Federal courts have consistently found that there are no constitutionally protected environmental rights pursuant to the Fifth, Ninth, and Fourteenth Amendments. Statements made in dissenting opinions or in decisions that lost on other grounds, however, indicate that the notion of a fundamental right to environmental integrity has merit. For example, in 1972, the Federal Court for the Eastern District of Arkansas stated that such claims, even under our present Constitution, are not fanciful and may indeed someday, in one way or another, obtain judicial recognition. Precedent can, of course, be rejected. Also, courts are not strictly limited to domestic precedent. They may look to international law for respected reasoning and guidance. Per the authority of the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution, the Supreme Court has stated that international law is part of our law and must be ascertained and administered by the courts of justice of appropriate jurisdiction as often as questions of right depending upon it are duly presented for their determination. 
and that courts should refer to customs and usages of civilized nations, not for speculation concerning what the law ought to be, but for trustworthy evidence of what the law really is. Indirect incorporation of international law is an established and appropriate means of guiding, interpreting, and applying domestic law, particularly with regard to the broad normative standards set by international human rights law. Thus, in considering whether there is a right to human integrity, a right to atmospheric integrity, courts should consider that international human rights instruments, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, protect fundamental rights as well as the basic necessities of life that are threatened by catastrophic climate change. Under international law, the United States has assumed both duties and obligations to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. These responsibilities would be further heightened if the court were to recognize a right to atmospheric integrity as an emergent human right. Additionally, courts should consider international environmental declarations and covenants, including the 1972 Stockholm De Declaration of the Human Environment, the 1992 Rio Declaration on Environment and Development, and the 1992 United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. By considering both international human rights and environmental law, courts may incorporate respect for basic and human rights, environmental integrity, and sustainable economic development into their decisions. Prudential arguments take political and economic circumstances into account. Given that the overwhelming evidence that human-caused climate change is imposing current impacts with significant costs and extraordinary future risks to society and natural systems, and that the cost of inaction greatly outweighs the cost of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the prudent course of action is clearly to start reducing emissions immediately. Conversely, ignoring climate change will limit economic growth and could create risk of major disruption to economic and social activities. As temperatures increase, aggregate economic damages will also accelerate. Therefore, mitigation with opportunities for growth and development along the way represents a wise investment. Climate science and economic analysis both provide prudential arguments for immediate action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Ethical arguments reflect the character or ethos of the American polity and compel solutions that comport with the sort of people we are. The American identity is defined largely by individualism. This notion must be tempered, however, by our nation's Judeo-Christian heritage, which teaches social responsibility. For example, Jewish theology teaches that there are ethical obligations for the living to live equitably within the boundaries of what the earth can sustain, and an obligation to extend that process to generations of humans and non-humans still unborn. Christian teaching simultaneously, similarly, invite environmental stewardship. For example, a Southern Baptist Declaration on the Environment and Climate Change invokes scripture to motivate climate action. Quote, we must care about environmental and climate issues because we are called to love our neighbors, to do unto others as we would have them do unto us, and to protect and care for the least of these." End quote. Likewise, Catholic teachings indicate that creation is the beginning and foundation of all God's works, and consequently, the environment must be seen as God's gift to all people, and the use we make of it entails a shared responsibility for all humanity, especially the poor in future generations. Concepts of intergenerational equity can be found outside of Judeo-Christian, outside of Judeo-Christianity too. For example, in Islamic law, in European in, and American civil law, in African customary law, and in non-theistic non -theistic traditions such as Shinto. As such, the concept of intergenerational responsibility is broadly recognized. I include these reference not to blur the line between church and state. Rather, I seek to demonstrate that accepting shared responsibility for the physical world and vulnerable populations, including those yet to be born, is consistent with millennia of moral teachings and is firmly rooted in the Judeo-Christian moral and ethical standards of Western civilization and thus defines the sort of people that we are. Finally, structural arguments. The legislative, executive, and judicial branches are co-equal branches of government. Within this scheme, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. 
Thus, the Supreme Court has the authority to articulate constitutional rights. Once such rights are recognized, it is also the judiciary's duty to see to it that no right secured by the supreme law of the land is impaired or destroyed by legislation. Courts are thus uniquely qualified to recognize and safeguard important principles and values. The right to atmospheric integrity such that the climate does not shift beyond the relatively stable range of the Holocene era during which modern human society has evolved is surely an important value worth safeguarding. The current administration is hostile towards even the idea of climate change, and Congress has thus far failed to effectively address climate change. The judicial branch is therefore our last and best hope for a federal, federal response to climate change. The court has recognized that the full scope of the liberty guaranteed by the due process clause cannot be found in or limited by the precise terms of the specific guarantees elsewhere provided in the Constitution. Indeed, the court has repeatedly recognized new fundamental liberty rights. It is now time for the court to recognize a right to atmospheric integrity. Our nation's history, traditions, and ethos provide evidence of deeply rooted intergenerational obligations which impose both positive and negative duties on the present generation. Precedent embraces the precept that property rights must be exercised in such a manner as not to injure one's neighbors. If one considers neighbors in time, as well as neighbors in geographic space, the same principles may be used to restrain current exploitation of carbon resources. Additionally, international law reflects broad normative standards that human rights, environmental integrity, and economic development should be balanced. Also, more than half of the world's constitutions, and nearly all that have been adopted since 1972, include a constitutional provision regarding environmental quality. The international trend is thus towards greater legal recognition of environmental rights. Science and economics indicate that the prudent course forward in order to maintain a world in which liberty and justice are possible is to immediately begin reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Science also provides a careful prescription to orient policymakers and their efforts to protect the asserted right. That is, returning to a concentration of less than or equal to 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will likely stabilize the climate without further global warming. Thus, once a right to atmospheric integrity is established by the court under its duty to say what the law is, annual targets are available as guideposts for responsible decision making by the judicial, executive, and legislative branches as well as by the private sector. I'm now going to turn my attention to an ongoing lawsuit intended to secure recognition of, fundamental right, of a fundamental right to atmospheric integrity. The lawsuit relies in part on some of the same arguments I made in my paper. It is a case brought against the U.S. government by eight, 18 youth plaintiffs age 8 to 19 when the suit was filed in 2015. Other plaintiffs include environmental organizations and a guardian for future generations. So the first step in initiating a lawsuit is to file a complaint with the appropriate court, and in that complaint, the plaintiffs, the party bringing the suit, describe how they have been harmed and what laws have been violated. In this case, the plaintiffs have alleged that the government inaction and action that results in carbon pollution of the atmosphere, car climate destabilization, and ocean acidification are violated are violations of their due process and equal protection rights under the 5th and 14th Amendments, are violations of the unenumerated rights preserved um, for the people by the 9th Amendment. And I did skip over that slide. So the um, any powers not given to the U.S. government through the um, Constitution as a whole are retained by the people through, um, they would have been retained even without um, the Ninth Amendment, but this clarifies that any rights not given to the government are retained by the people. So again, that's one of the um, claims in the Juliana v. U.S. lawsuit. And their final um, assertion is that the government's action and inaction 
is a violation of the public trust doctrine. They research assert that these violations occurred and continue to occur because the federal government has known for decades that carbon pollution was causing catastrophic climate change and that massive emission reductions and a nationwide transition away from fossil fuels was needed to protect plaintiffs' constitutional rights. They further assert that in spite of the government's knowledge of the severe dangers posed by climate pollution, defendants created and enhanced the dangers through fossil fuel extraction, production, consumption, transportation, and exportation. With regard to the specific violations of law, I will give you just a sampling of the allegations within each category. With regard to due process, the plaintiffs allege that the affirmative aggregate acts of defendants have been and are infringing on plaintiffs' right to life by causing dangerous carbon dioxide concentration in our nation's atmosphere and dangerous interference with our country's stable climate system. They also assert that defendants have been and are infringing on the plaintiff's liberties by placing plaintiffs in a position of danger with the destabilized climate system and dangerous levels of CO2 in our country's atmosphere. Defendants' aggregate acts of increasing CO2 concentration in the atmosphere have been and are harming plaintiff's dignity, including their capacity to provide for their basic human needs, safely raise families, practice their religious and cultural beliefs, maintain their bodily integrity, and lead lives with access to clean air, water, shelter, and food. With regard to equal protection, the plaintiffs assert that the defendants, the defendants acts in the areas of fossil fuel, fuel production and consumption irreversibly discriminate discriminate against plaintiffs' exercise of their fundamental rights of life, liberty, and property and abridge central precepts of equality. The affirmative aggregate acts of defendants in the areas of fossil fuel production and consumption have caused and are causing irreversible climate change. As a result, the harm caused by defendants has denied plaintiffs the same protection of fundamental rights afforded to prior and present generations of adult citizens. The Ninth Amendment argument is that among the implicit liberties protected from government intrusion by the Ninth Amendment is the right to be sued by our the right to be sustained by our country's vital natural systems, including our climate system. Under the heading of the public trust doctrine, plaintiffs assert that as sovereign trustees, the acts of the defendants are unconstitutional and in contravention of their duty to hold the atmosphere and other public trust resources in trust. Instead, defendants have alienated substantial portions of the atmosphere in favor of the interests of private parties so that these private parties can treat our nation's atmosphere as a dump for their carbon emissions. Defendants have failed in their duty of care as trustees to manage the atmosphere in the best interests of the present and future beneficiaries of the trust property, including but not limited to plaintiffs. So these are just some of the charges contained in the complaint. Once a complaint is filed in court, um, the opposing side, the defendants, have an opportunity to file an answer. In this case, the federal government's answer was a motion to dismiss. Um, essentially, they said defendants haven't stated a claim because there's no basis in law um, for a due process right to a particular climate system. There's then an opportunity for oral arguments um, before a magistrate judge, which is the lowest level of judge in federal court. And in this case, um, his name was Judge Coffin. He issued an order remanding, um, recommending that the motion to dismiss be, be denied, meaning that the case could go forward. His order was upheld um, by Judge Ann Aiken. And in a very long and thorough opinion, she acknowledged that the legal challenges faced by petitioners in bringing this novel case, um, but she continued, exercising my reasoned judgment, I have no doubt that the right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life is fundamental to free and ordered society. Just as marriage is the foundation of the family, a stable climate system is quite literally the foundation of society, without which there could be neither civilization nor progress. And then she cites a case from the Philippines in which the Supreme Court of the Philippines undertook a form of prudential analysis in which they were asked to give meaning and balance to the nation's constitutional right to life 
in combination with a constitutional policy directive that the state shall protect and advance the right of the people to a balanced and healthful ecology in accord with the rhythm and harmony of nature. The court found that the plaintiffs, again, they were minor children, and determined that the right to a healthful ecology coupled with the Philippine Constitution's right to life provision imposed a solemn obligation on the state to protect both interests both interests, because a failure to do so would condemn future generations to inherit nothing but parched earth incapable of sustaining life. So here's an example where a federal U.S. judge is drawing from international law to support her finding. Judge Aiken continued, in this opinion, this court simply holds that where a complaint alleges governmental action is affirmatively and substantially damaging the climate system in a way that will cause human death, shorten human lifespans, result in widespread damage to property, threaten human food sources, and dramatically alter the planet's ecosystem, it states a claim for a due process violation. To hold otherwise would be to say that the Constitution affords no protection against a government's knowing decision to poison the air its citizens breathe or the water its citizens drink. Plaintiffs have adequately alleged infringement of a fundamental right. So this decision is groundbreaking in its preliminary recognition of the possibility of a fundamental constitutional right to a stable climate. But it is still just an opinion on a motion to dismiss. It's not a final judgment. Um, the result of Judge Aiken's order is that the case was to move forward. And in fact, a trial date was set for February of 2018. However, um, in response to Judge Aiken's order, um, the defendants um, first appealed within the district court. That appeal was denied. So then they took the extraordinary action of filing um, a writ a petition for a writ of mandamus with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals asking that the proceedings in the district court be stayed, which means be put on hold, while the appellate court considered the petition. The substance of their petition is that um, asking the U.S. government to respond to petition's complaint was so onerous it was just a waste of resources and um, it should just be, the case should be stopped in its tracks. Um, in July, the Ninth Circuit issued an order staying the proceedings in district court. Since then, plaintiffs had filed their answer to the writ of mandamus. The district court submitted a letter stating that the case should not be dismissed and should be allowed to go to trial. And eight Friends of the Court briefs have been filed on the petitioner's behalf. Um, plaintiffs are now waiting for a three-judge Ninth Circuit panel to rule on the petition. So that's kind of in limbo. Um, the lower court ruling, like I said, is um, groundbreaking in the recognition of a fundamental right to constitute to um, climate stability. But it's still, it's just a preliminary ruling in what, um, if it does go to trial, um, is almost certainly, if plaintiffs succeed at any step along the way, it's almost certainly going to be appealed first to circuit court and then um, to the Supreme Court. So there's a lot of potential um, riding on this lawsuit. And while that lawsuit, the federal lawsuit, is simmering, I want to tell you briefly about a local effort um, where I first met Professor Woodward um, asking the Department of Environmental Protection to implement an existing climate change law. So Maine has a statute passed in 2013 that sets goals for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we've met the short-term goal, um, and the short-term reduce emissions to 1990 levels by January 2010. We're on target to meet the medium-term goal, which is reduction to 10% below 1990 levels by January 2020. And the long-term goal is the really interesting one, and the long-term reduction sufficient to eliminate any dangerous threat to the climate. To accomplish this goal, reduction to 75 to 80 percent below 2003 levels may be required. So Maine is, um, does have efforts in place to address climate change and emission reductions. Um, Maine is a participant in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Inventory um, Cap and Trade Program. Um, we were able to meet the 2010 and seem to be on target to meet the 2020 reductions because 
more of market forces than because of policy initiatives, transition to natural gas um, from coal and oil. Um, but there are no robust plans in place, and certainly not under the current administration, um, to come anywhere close to reducing emissions um, 75 to 80 percent below 2003 levels in the long term. And of course, long term isn't even defined. Um, so I've been working with a group on a um, citizen's petition for rulemaking. Under the Maine Administrative Procedures Act, 150 registered voters can petition any executive agency and with for rulemaking. And upon receipt of that petition signed by 150 registered voters, the agency is compelled to initiate a rulemaking proceeding. So um, over the past, when did we start? Well, the current effort, we began collecting signatures, I want to say beginning of October. Does that seem right? Um, we have well over 150, we're um, upwards of 600 um, signatures at this point. Our intention, so there's, um, of course, rules to be followed. Um, the individual has to be a registered voter. Um, signatures have to be segregated by town, so you need you know, a separate sheet for the town of Saco and a separate for Biddeford and for Gorm and South Portland. Um, those signatures have to be brought to the town clerk to be verified. So we're now in the process of having, before the signatures are verified, they have to be notarized. So in the process of the notarization and the verification, our intention is to deliver the signatures to DEP in early December, which would compel them to initiate rulemaking in um, the first part of 2018. So that is a current local ongoing effort. And um, I think I'll stop here and I'd be happy to take any questions. I'd like to say, because we're recording this, we'd like to ask you to speak into the microphone if you have a question. So raise your hand and I'll bring it to you. Thank you very much. I, it, was, uh, it was very interesting. You know, one, one question that came to my mind, you know, and I thought you did a, a really interesting job of, of, a, of illustrating the argument on why a fundamental right in the Constitution would exist to the atmospheric integrity. <coughs> and I really like those letters, sort of, I think that in, 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 in the language that you quoted from the due process. But it strikes me as there's another hurdle, and I'm wondering if this came up in, in the case opinion, meaning that the Constitution generally restricts governmental action, right? And so assuming that, in fact, the fundamental right exists, then the government really is in a lot of ways prohibited from infringing on it. But my, my guess is it's really not so much the federal government polluting the atmosphere, it's more private entities. So it's almost like a step away, right? We, ha we have to kind of force the government to force private entities from polluting, right? Which is mm -hmm. kind of not usually within the reach of the Constitution. So I just didn't know if, what your familiarity was that, how, how the parties sort of addressed that topic. Yeah, so um, I can kind of address it broadly. Um, so the plaintiff's contention in the federal lawsuit is that the federal government, by leasing public lands, by permitting um, things like um, pipelines and ports, they are facilitating the production of fossil fuels. So, um, you're, but you're right, M you know, Exxon, Mobil, um, British Petroleum, they're private industries. Um, plaintiff's argument is that um, the federal government has known for 50 years at least that um, carbon pollution um, will disrupt the climate. And rather than um, implementing policies to shift our nation away from a fossil fuel based economy, they embraced and encouraged it. I'll ask my own question. Okay. Beth, isn't it true, is it true that the, um, the fossil fuel industries originally joined the suit on behalf of, the, they joined the side, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. voluntarily joined with the federal government to defend against this, and since they have 
state withdrawn. petition yep. to be to withdrawn. Right. Could you comment so, on that? Um, this case was filed in 2015 um, under the um, Obama administration or against the Obama administration. And um, the fossil fuel industry, the American Manufacturers Association, the American Petroleum Institute joined as interveners. So they petitioned the court and said, hey, um, we don't think the Obama administration is going to look out for our interests. We want to join the lawsuit. Um, they were granted permission by the court to join. And then, um, let me go back. So in June or July of this year, they again petitioned and said, you know what, we want out. Um, there's the change in administration. Of course, the Trump administration is all for um, fossil fuel development. Um, so they feel, my understanding is that they feel that their rights will be protected by the administration. And also, once litigation moves into the litigation stage, um, there's a process called discovery where each side presents, um, shares their information with the other side. So plaintiffs were asking ExxonMobil, for example, um, for their internal research on um, carbon emissions and the effects of production of um, fossil fuels. And my understanding is that um, the industry decided that maybe they didn't want their internal um, fossil fuel, um, their, they didn't want it to become public, um, their knowledge of um, the impacts of climate change and the potential danger created by their industries. So um, they petitioned um, to withdraw from the case and that request was granted. Um, why do you think only one judge was kind of um, fighting to send this case to court? Um, it was just the structure of the court. There was, so first there was the magistrate court, or magistrate judge Coffin. Um, so generally when, um, you know, a complaint is filed, it's the magistrate judge is, um, is the first to hear it and to then, in Maine it's called a report and recommendation, in um, Oregon it's findings and recommendation, but it's a report that he sends to the more senior judge and it was her opinion that was, um, and ordinarily, in my own experience doing administrative law here in Maine, the report and recommended decisions, they're like two or three pages, um, say, giving the reasons why they either accept or reject the lower um, or the less senior judge's opinion. Um, I think Judge Aiken, I mean, she must have, um, found this very compelling. It is an extremely well-researched and thorough opinion um, in, on a motion to dismiss. You know, generally you say, yes, the case can go forward, or no, it can't. Um, I, and now, you know, she has it on the record that um, she at least believes there's a cognizable um, right to a stable climate. Can you tell us a little bit more about the 20, or about the 19 plaintiffs? Because they are a lot like the students in this room. I don't know any of them personally. Um, they are um, college students, high school students. Um, they are from all walks of life, all different parts of the country. There's a young woman from, I want to say Dorchester. Massachusetts. Um, there's an Alaska native who lives up near the Arctic Circle. His um, his village is in danger of um, falling into the sea. Um, there's a young man. He has a name that's very difficult for me to pronounce. Um, from Colorado or New Mexico, and he's quite an activist in his own right. Um, he's addressed the United Nations. Um, 
Dr. James Hansen, who's a leading climate scientist, his granddaughter is one of the plaintiffs, and he's actually um, a plaintiff on behalf of future generations. So that's a very unique, um, I haven't s seen, it. oftentimes in court filings you'll see um, somebody acting as a guardian for a minor child. Um, but in this case, um, he filed as a guardian on behalf of future generations, which is very unique and interesting. Yeah, I know. So I'm, I'm hoping to, to, to push. But I, I want, and I'm just curious, what, have they given any thought to what a win looks like? And what I mean by that is, I mean, this would make complete sense in the sense of you can't dump chemicals into drinking water and, and those types of things. But when you get into carbon emissions, my guess is what's going to probably come up at some point, assuming this was to develop, you know, sooner or later, would be, well, listen, we've, we've got to, at this point in time, pollute the environment to keep the environment going. Because if we get the economy at 4 or 5%, our technological advancements are far greater than if it's at 1%. And we're actually better off, you know, in the long. I mean, I, my guess is you probably get some types of arguments like that. And so I'm just curious if there's been any sort of, sort of sense or or, or organized structure on what would a, a victory be in the sense of it means, you know, only companies can only pollute a certain amount of money. You know, I mean, it just seems like it would be messy, I guess, to some degree. I just didn't know if there was any foresight into that. Well, in terms of what they're asking the court. Um, for is a declaration, so they're not asking for money, they're not asking for damages. Um, they want a declaration that defendants have violated and are violating plaintiffs' fundamental rights. Um, they want defendants, you know, U.S. government, um, to um, stop further violations and develop a um, climate recovery plan based on the best available science to ratchet down emissions um, to get to that 350 parts per million by 2100. So the amount per year will vary depending on um, when emission reductions start. And of course, you know, the U.S. is one player in a global, on a global issue. Um, the U.S. by itself can't um, resolve climate change. Um, but by failing to act to do anything, um, you know, plaintiffs are, you know, alleging violation of these constitutional rights. Um, and as part of their filings with the court are, um, you know, plans by specialists in areas that have demonstrated that, you know, using alternative technology, solar and wind and hydro and, um, that the technology exists to transition towards a non-carbon economy, um, but there needs to be the political will to do it. If I could comment, yes. to, I just want to comment on that for just a minute too, and to fill in there a little bit. Um, when the Supreme Court um, decided in, I believe it was 2000 and seven or 2008 that there that there was a con that uh, the Environmental Protection Agency had a requirement to limit that carbon was a pollutant then this government um, began to develop the clean power plan for example which this administration has now rescinded my ima I imagine you can comment on this that for example a win in this case would mean that there would be it would the idea of rescinding the Clean Power Plant might even be unconstitutional because it violated the constitutional rights of the citizens to, you know, maybe I'm taking that a little too far. But I imagine it as being um, legal standing to, um, you know, the many, the many um, policy changes that the legislature or others have tried to put through from cap and trade in 2009 to the Clean Power Plan have been thwarted, either have not gone forward or now being rescinded, and perhaps a constitution, a win in this case would give more um, credence and power to those to be upheld. Am I dreaming here, or no, do you think I that think that's you're part right, of? Because then you would, um, There would be tension between, um, you know, property rights, you know, who owns the mineral rights to the oil that's in the ground, and, you know, um, 
the courts would be called on to balance the um, property rights versus a right to a stable climate. And um, where they come down on that, you know, I can't speculate. But um, the case you brought up, um, Massachusetts versus EPA, which um, established that carbon dioxide is a pollutant and can be regulated by the EPA. Part of that decision says something like, um, even though um, you know EPA, the U.S. by itself can't fix the problem, it doesn't mean they shouldn't try. That even though the um, the solution might be kind of messy, there's still an obligation to try to um, control greenhouse gas emissions. Hi, I was wondering if you could discuss a little bit more about Maine's efforts um, to reduce our CO2 emissions, what those efforts might be, um, and also what other states are doing. Oh, that's a big question. Um, so specifically what we ask for in our petition to DEP is um, reductions of greenhouse reductions of 8% per year of greenhouse gas emissions from um, entities that DEP is presently regulating. So this is a petition for rulemaking. We're sort of constrained to what um, what is within DEP's power to regulate. Um, so for instance, um, I want to say any facility that emits is a certain amount of tons and I don't want to say you know establish the tons I want to say it's 10,000 tons of CO2 per year but I'm not 100% certain about that um, but you know that would be an example of um, large facilities um, that are presently being regulated, that they would annually ratchet down their emissions. Um, similarly, um, facility or fleets um, who have large emissions, they would also, by converting, for example, to electric vehicles, um, reduce their emissions year after year. Um, The state of Massachusetts, they actually have a constitutional provision um, protecting environmental interests sort of generally. And our Children's Trust, along with Conservation Law Foundations and some other f um, partners, um, brought a successful lawsuit a few years ago in Massachusetts, um, which ended up in a ruling compelling the state, so not just one agency, but you know the whole executive branch, to um, implement um, rules and policies to minimize greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so Massachusetts is a leader, California is a leader, um, state of Washington is, um, I would say, they're a leader as well. Um, and I should say you can look, um, you can Google our Children's Trust and they have a state page where state by state they tell you exactly what's going on in each state as well. And there's the web address. There's the web address. More questions? All right, if that's, if that's all, let's give, uh, let's give Elizabeth Valentine a good round of applause.